Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Dan Harari, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Do you mind introducing yourself to everyone out there listening? Sure. Hi. Thank you, Robbie, for having me. I really appreciate it. My name is Dan Harari. I live and work in Beverly Hills, California. Uh, I've been a Hollywood publicist for 40 years. This year is my 40th anniversary as a Hollywood publicist. I've worked with a lot, a lot of very famous people in 40 years. Uh, I wrote a book that came out in 2022 called <laughs> Flirting with Fame. A, a, I always have to read the sub headline. A Hollywood publicist recalls 50 years of celebrity close encounters. And uh, there's a lot of funny stories in there. You know, like when I met Spielberg and Jerry Seinfeld, I worked with Bruce Springsteen in high school. Um, uh, so yeah, so I make a living as a Hollywood publicist still, still now. I'm 68 years old. I'm not retired. I love what I do. And uh, <clears throat> my company's called the Asbury PR Agency. I grew up in Asbury Park, New Jersey. So I named my company after my hometown. Um, and in addition to my Hollywood work, I have also had something of a paranormal life since the age of five. And my brand new book, which just came out a few weeks ago, which is called My Paranormal Life, Robbie, this is my paranormal memoir. These are all real stories about ghosts and poltergeists and incredible coincidences, voices I've heard in my ears. Uh, once I heard a voice in a chandelier, it changed my life. Um, my ufo sightings that's all my real stuff and uh i think that's what you want to talk about today is is the, is the paranormal yeah i want to hear about your first paranormal experience but i would like to get your thoughts on the paranormal um obviously i think it's kind of a topic for a lot of people that you know, they're introduced at some point to it and then they kind of comes and goes throughout their life i'm wondering if you stuck with it if you researched into it more or was it just these experiences that you kept having that caused it to stay kind of prominent into your, at least, thoughts? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, again, so, you know, 40 straight years Hollywood publicist, you know, day and night, that's my profession. Um, I wrote my book, Flirting with Fame, and it did pretty well. I got a lot of press for that book. And then after that, I wrote a sci-fi book about benevolent aliens that came out last year called After They Came. And this book... Uh, put me on the map in the world of ufology. It, I, I promoted it at a bunch of UFO conventions. And along the way, Robbie, I befriended Stephen Bassett. I'm sure you know Steve Bassett. And he's a very good friend of mine. He and I created the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance last year together. And uh, so because of that book, I became prominent in the field of ufology. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It's the last thing in, in a million years. I never would have expected that to happen. Okay, so now to answer your question, last year, after these two books were, you know, out and doing well, I'm like, you know, I think I have another book in me. Like, you know, I have a lot of weird things have happened to me. So this is probably about a year and a half ago. I just sat down with myself and <laughs> I just wrote down and, you know, I always write my books first draft in, by, with a pen in my hand. And I just wrote, you know, like after my father died, he he visited me as a ghost a number of times in my bedroom. So I wrote that down. Then I'm like, you know, 20 years ago, my grandfather was a poltergeist in my house. So, okay, I wrote that down. And then I wrote down my my three UFO sightings. I now have had four. I had one two months ago at Contact in the Desert, but that didn't make the book. So three UFO sightings. And then just like voices I've heard that have told me to do things that changed my life. And incredible coincidences. Um... Uh, uh, just l literally things that are inexplicable. A lot of inexplicable things have happened to me. My first story, Robbie, and I've had this story my whole life. I never really told this story to anyone. And I said, you know, I should probably start with this story when I was five. And I'll do that one in a second. But that very first story, it's the first chapter of my book. It's called My Gargoyle. And when I told my daughter, my daughter's 34. And I said, you know, did I ever tell you this story? She goes, no. And I told her, she goes, oh, my God, Dad. She goes, that sounds like a gargoyle a creature. And then I told my mother it, it happened. And she goes, you were dreaming. It, it was a dream. I go, Mom, it wasn't a dream. This it was my first memory. So let me tell you this story. And from there, Robbie, it just rolled out. I just did it chronologically. Um, and again, two months ago, I saw a, UFO, a magnificent UFO at Contact in the Desert. So I'm still having interesting experiences in my life. So I grew up in the New Jersey shore. 
Uh, I'm the oldest of three brothers. And in 1961, I was five years old. And I lived with my parents in a house near Asbury Park. And I had two little girlfriends that lived right across the street. They were sisters. They were a little older than me. So if I was five, they were probably six and eight. And the three of us used to go up and down the street and neighborhood climbing fences and climbing trees. I remember that we used to climb. That's what we did. We climbed things together. So one day, 1961, I'm five years old. These two little girls said, hey, let's climb the billboard sign at the end of the block where I lived was a little bit elevated. And then around the corner and below us was a mini mall. And in the mini mall was a drugstore. The drugstore had a 30 foot tall billboard sign promoting the drugstore. <clears throat> so my little girlfriends, Kathy and Lizzie, I remember their name. We went inside the, the wooden skeleton lattice that held up this billboard sign and we were climbing it, right? Now this, climb, uh, this sign had to be 30 feet tall, it had to be. So we're climbing, climbing. I remember, Robbie, I remember very clearly, man. We were climbing, climbing. The, me and these little two little girls were climbing up. <clears throat> and as I was getting near the top of the sign, my hands slipped off the wood. I, I remember this. I saw my hands. They slipped off the beam I was holding like this. And then I was on my back, and I'm now falling through the air. They're 20, at least 25 feet. Falling through the air, looking up. My face is looking at the sky. And I'm falling in slow motion. I remember I was falling in slow because it was like weird. I remember falling in slow motion. These two little girls above me, they're looking down at me. They're screaming like, Danny, Danny. Okay. So I'm falling, falling, falling. Now we have missing time. Okay. I have missing time. And I just realized this recently that I had, that it was missing time. I wake up. I don't know if it's a minute or an hour or two hours later. I have no idea, but I have missing time. I wake up on a couch two houses away from the sign. I'd never been inside this house before in my life. No one was home in this, in this house. I'm on a couch. I remember being laying there. I, my eyes open. I sit up. And I said, hello, hello. Is anyone here? Uh, no one was home. No one was in this house. I had no idea how I got there. Okay. I've never been there before since. To this day, I, I couldn't tell you which house it was. I get up off the couch, Robbie. I look around. No, one, no one's there. I look to the right. There's a cryptid at the front door. There's a cryptid being. And I'm going to say he was six. It, it was six or seven feet tall. It was like white. I remember it as white chocolate color. It had like the bottom half was like the body of either like a bull or a donkey. It had like donkey legs the bottom half, and the top half looked like it was an angel, but the wings, it looked like it had had wings, but instead of wings, they were like bony stumps on the shoulders. It looked like, like my joke is God took a hedge clippers and cut off this creature's wings because there were bony stumps where wings would have been, okay? And then it had the face of a bull, that I remember. So I'm looking at this thing. This thing turns his head over his right shoulder, and he goes like this. He snorted at me, he snorted at me, like, and I'm looking, thinking this, whatever this is, doesn't like me very much. And then it left, it left, it went through the front door. I don't know if it vanished through the front door or opened the door, I don't remember. But when it snorted at me, I got the impression of, yeah, I just saved your life, but I didn't want to, you little bastard, you know, it's like something like that. That's my first paranormal in my whole life. It's my first memory, Robbie, in my whole life. It's vivid as anything. It's like, I'm looking at you, man. I remember it. It's, when my mother thinks it was a dream, it, it wasn't a dream. I remember it clearly. I'm trying to tra track down these two women. They would be 70 years old now, uh, but they're married. So I don't know their married names. Um, and my gut feeling is <clears throat> that I was going to be very seriously injured or killed when I fell off that sign. And whatever that thing was, I believe that thing saved my life. I don't know if it caught me, right, in, in his arms or, or it scooped me up and brought me to this couch, revived me somehow. I remember when I woke up on the couch thinking maybe I was dead. Um, and again, I was five. So do you know the name Yvonne Smith? Do you know who Yvonne Smith is? Sounds familiar. <clears throat> She's a famous hypnotherapist she hypnotizes people who have been abducted by extraterrestrials and you know re regression hypnosis and she uh, gets them to uh, remember their experiences so 
she's in she's going to <laughs> hypnotize me in two weeks from now about this story because i know there's more to this story i mean between me falling in the air and waking up on that couch i have missing time and uh, something remarkable happened to me i know it did do you believe you hit the ground though or do you think it caught you midair like did you wake up in pain or anything no no people it's a good, good question someone asked me that the other day nothing no pain nothing was broken i wasn't bleeding i i, I didn't have a broken arm or broken legs i was completely fine now to fall 25 feet when you're five and land on the ground at the least at the least i would have had the wind knocked out of me for sure but uh, honest to god man whatever this thing was this was not human it wasn't it whatever now maybe it was an extraterrestrial being maybe i was ab abducted and i lost time and they brought me back <clears throat> maybe my perception of this living room Here's another thing, Rob. I just thought about this recently. Maybe that living room wasn't a living room. You know, maybe I was elsewhere and and they made it look like a, a, a 1950s house so I would be comfortable in there. Uh, because when I walked out, I looked around, I didn't know where I was. And then I realized my mother's house was a few blocks to the left. So I walked home. I don't know. I, I would love to know more about that story. So that's the very first thing in my life. And then since then, I've had dozens of uh, odd things, but that's the first one. Did it just uptick from there, the more experiences you had? <laughs> um, that's a crazy experience for a first experience. It's a crazy experience. I would say the, the more dramatic ones in my life were sporadic. It's not like every day, man. It would be years and years and then something, and then years and years and then something. I just think whatever that was that day uh, opened a door for me personally with other things like the other side or or spiritual beings or, I mean, again, my dad and my grandfather, they both visited me after they died. I know it was them. So most of my friends never had a ghost in their house. I've had two. So I don't know. It's not like every day, man. Every couple of years, something will happen to me that's really remarkable. It usually affects my life in a good way. You know, usually it steers me. I'll give you an example. This is way out of chronology, but I'll give you a really good example. <clears throat> Sorry. In 1996, uh, I turned 40 and uh, I was a publicist in Hollywood. I was working for a, a, a prominent entertainment PR company for seven and a half years. And the head of this company was this little, very nasty man. And I, I hated this guy. I hated this guy. He was just not nice to me at all. And uh, so I turned 40. I'm with my boss. We're at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. It was the week of my 40th birthday. And he's sitting there with these two clients. And he's trying to impress them. And he's telling them how great he is. And he's a genius. And he's a millionaire. And he's telling them how great he is, my boss. And I hated this guy, man. I just, I couldn't stomach him. And I'm sitting there in my suit and tie because he always wanted me to wear a suit for a client meeting, which I hate wearing suits. And I'm writing down notes about how great he is. I'm just taking notes. Minding my own business. I just turned 40. And I'm thinking as I'm sitting there, why do I work for this guy? I hate this guy's guts. I said, so why am I working for this guy? Now, I swear to God, on my daughter's life, this is a true story. I'm sitting there at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. There's a chandelier above my head to the left in the ceiling. A chandelier, Robbie. And I swear to you, the chandelier said, Dan, I look like this. Start your own business. That loud, right to me in my ears. No one else heard this. I looked up. I said, what? Start your own business. And that was the end. I went like this. I'm like, holy S. Did that really, holy God, that happened? Now, at the time, I had like 12 clients of my own that were paying my boss 90% of the money. I was only getting 10% of my clients, right? I turned the page and I write down all my clients that I had. And I thought, if I got 100% of my clients, my clients, Instead of 10% of my clients, I wrote it all down on paper. I go, I'd be a millionaire. I'd be, I'd be wealthy. I stand up in the middle of this meeting. My boss goes, what, what's happening? I go, 
I have to go now. Bye. I stood up in the middle of a meeting, which I never did in my life. It's the greatest moment in my professional life ever. I got one. I just stood up and I left. I went home. I called all the clients I had had at the time. I said, if I went out on my own, would you would you come with me? Everyone said we would follow you. One one guy said I'd follow you to Botswana. Wherever you go, I go. So now instead of making eighty thousand a year from this one idea, now I'm going to make four hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay, from the I swear to you, from the chandelier, the chandelier changed my life. The chandelier. Now, how do you explain that one? It was like God talking to Moses on, on Mount Sinai. I have no idea how it happened. But uh, three months later, I had my own business. I made half a million dollars the first year. And it was just a, re a phenomenon. It, it was remarkable how that happened. I don't know what it was. It, was that God? Was it a spirit guide that I had, you know, an angel? Was it my own inner voice? But, but I heard it out. I mean, I heard it in my ears from above. My mother goes, you had a good idea. No, mom, I heard it because it came, came up from above, right? Now, this is before my father died, because after my father died, he gave me messages. I don't know who that was. I don't know who it was, but I'm very grateful because it changed my life. And I can't explain that. But that's just one of many stories I have. Do you think that was like someone, like a family member talking to you? Or you ever theorized about what could possibly that have been? I mean, your inner consciousness or something? Well, I had a dear damn, friend. Give me the Powerball numbers or something. Holy. Well, you know, it's funny. I've told this story all over the world. And some people said, God, I need a chandelier. You know, I, I want a chandelier. In fact, in my book, I took a picture of that chandelier last year. And there's a picture of it in my book, My Paranormal Life. I mean, if it was Pee Wee's Playhouse, I'd understand a chandelier talking to you. But as God is my way. You know what my joke is, Robbie? The chandelier spoke unto me. It spoke unto me. Right. Because think about Moses on, in, in Mount Sinai. Moses, yes. You know, let my people go, right? Tell the Pharaoh, let my people, right? Dan, yes. Start your own. <laughs> I'm, 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 not, I'm not equating myself to Moses. That was great advice. But it changed my life. Now, my company's 28 years old. I've been my own boss. I've made millions and millions of dollars. I mean, my, I've been my own boss for 28 years. I got rid of this little, you know, bastard guy. I, I bailed on him and when he found out what happened, his head exploded. People told me he went crazy. So uh, it was probably the best single, other than my kids being born, it was the best single thing that ever happened to me was the chandelier. I think it might have been a dead friend I had from the East Coast. I had a very dear friend named Paul. We were very tight. And then uh, he encouraged me to move to L.A. I, moved, I came to L.A. when I was 24. I had nothing. I had no money, no car, no job, no connections, no girlfriends. I had nothing. I had one friend who let me sleep on her couch for a year on Venice Beach. He died when I was in my late 20s. So now I'm 40. I think perhaps it was my friend Paul who said, Dan, start your own business. It, 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 it would have been something my friend Paul would have said to me. So perhaps it was him. Maybe. That's the best I can do. Or God. Or, or I have a spirit guide that I'd love to meet and shake his or her hand because that person changed my life. I, I would probably lean more towards your friend just because I don't I haven't heard any stories about God calling anybody's name out specifically before a message was delivered. Look, I mean, wouldn't it be great, Robbie, if that was God? I mean, really, because he said it said Dan like this, Dan, to get my attention. I'm 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 taking notes with this prick of a boss. Literally, I'm just taking notes and being miserable with my life. Dan, like that, Dan, and I turned my head. It was a pause. Start your own business. It was that loud, Robbie. It was like I would have questioned it first of all. Like, why are you talking? You're talking chandelier. Prove you're something else, and then if the house shakes, that's when you know. You know what? I've learned to go with the flow. To go with the flow when something like that happens, and things like that have happened to me really my whole life, but very rarely. And that's a that's probably the most dramatic one. Like like. Uh, I'll give you another. These are all over the map. I do want to hear about your grandfather, though, because I know you touched a Ouija board. I give you so much credit for that, because I, I think most kids my age have been steered off of ever getting near one of those things, afraid they're going to call something into the universe. That's what people tell me. People said, be wary of, <laughs> people, be wary of Ouija boards, because they'll tell you whatever. You, someone told me this the other day. 
they'll tell you whatever you want to hear. Uh, yeah, I could do that one. They sell them at Toys R Us, which is crazy. Yeah, that's that's a powerful thing, man. Because uh, let me tell you my story. You tell me what you think of this one. <clears throat> 20 years ago, 21 years ago I, is when I first moved to, I've lived in LA since 1980, but in 21 years ago, I moved into Beverly Hills. I had a girlfriend. She and I found this fantastic apartment in Beverly Hills, huge apartment with a fireplace. And uh, we moved in together. I, she th I thought maybe we would get married, but she had a cat and I'm very <laughs> allergic to cats. And, it, and I was sick and she would not get rid of the cat. So that didn't work out. And that's uh, irrelevant. We move into this house together. She moved in first. Uh, this is the this is uh, early two thousand and what year was that? Two thousand and three, early two thousand and three. She moved in first, and then I moved in a few days later. So she's moving in. There's three moving men out at the moving truck on the in the street in front of the new house. She's just putting her things away. There's three guys out on the street. She hears the following, Joe, like that, Joe, she turned around. No one was in the house. It was just her. She called me at work at my office and she said, Danny, yeah, she goes, someone just said Joe to me in the apartment. I go, well, how to be one of the moving men? She goes, no, they're outside. They're at the truck. They're not here. No one's here. I said, okay, that's weird, right? Okay, that's number one. Then I moved in a few days later. A week later, we're sitting. I remember we were watching American Idol. It's the only time I ever saw the show in my life. We're watching American Idol. Now we're both moved in. And I hear this like plop. I hear like plop in the dining room. I'm like, what is that? So I go into the dining room. We had had a, a, a sack of kitchen utensils in the dining room that we had not yet put away. On the top was this uh, kitchen sink drainer thing you know that has the slots where you we put kitchen sinks to dry off it was at the top of this package it had been sitting there for days somehow it had popped out of the sack and was like three or four feet upside down in front of the sack just it came out moved across the room and, pl and plopped upside down for no apparent reason there was not an earthquake or anything i looked at it i said how the hell did that happen how did this thing pop out of there that makes no sense so I put it back in the sack. All right, now the story gets way, way better. Week after that, I love this one, man. Week after that, I went to make a fire in our, we had a beautiful fireplace in the living room. I had bought, you know, those, those long um, decorative fireplace matches. They come in like in a long cylinder a tube, right? Okay, so I was going to make a fire in the fireplace. My girlfriend was making dinner in the kitchen. I opened one end of this canister. There are 50, ma 50 matches. <laughs> I take the canister end off. I grabbed all 50, Robbie. I grabbed all 50 matches with my hand, and I pulled them out of this canister, all of them, so quickly that they lit. They lit. 50 matches in my hand, long ones, are now a torch. I have a torch in my hand, right? It's five inches in front of my face, six inches in front of my face, right? It could have singed off my eyebrows, right? Were you thinking, I got to get to the Olympics? No, I was thinking, oh, my God, my what little hair I have left on my head is going to go go up in flame. So, no, it happened. So I pulled them out, and it's a flame. It's a torch, literally a torch in my right hand. I'm holding a torch, and I was so stunned. I'm like, what the hell just happened? I, I'm staring at it. Now, again, I swear to you, this is true. From the dining room, I look from my left eye, there's this dark blue gray thing like a, like a, like i'm going to call it casper the friendly ghost without a face it was a bluish gray thing that flew i saw it flying through the air from the dining room flew through the air into the living room i'm watching it coming it came up to me it grabbed the torch robbie it grabbed it out of my hand because it pulled it out of my hand and it threw this torch into the fireplace and then this thing dissipated and I swear to you, that's a true story. And I'm like, what the hell was that? How did that? Because I didn't throw it in the fireplace. I was shocked that this happened at all. Something came and pulled it out of my hand, threw it in the fireplace. Okay, now the story escalates more. Like a week after that, my girlfriend and I are asleep. Three in the morning, we hear crash, really loud, crash. 
open the master bathroom, uh, my girlfriend's drinking glass had been thrown onto the floor and smashed into a million pieces. And just so, someone in anger had taken this glass and smashed it into a million pieces. There's no other explanation. There was not an earthquake. It was a tall, just regular drinking glass for water. She had it way in the back of the sink by the toothbrushes. Something had picked it up, smashed it on the ground, a million shards of glass are on the ground. No idea how that happened. Okay, now, that weekend, my kids came to visit me. I've been divorced forever. My kids came to visit me. I think my daughter was 12 and my son was 14 at the time. They had their own rooms on the weekends when they came to visit me. So that weekend, where everyone's asleep, middle of the night, and I hear, Dad, Dad, there's something in my room. There's something in my room, my son. I ran into my son's room. He's standing up in his room. He's shaking. He goes, Dad, something's been knocking on all of my walls. Something just knocked, like knock, 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 knock. And he showed me on the four walls with his knuckles. He said something knocked all the way around 360 in his room, including the glass screen of his TV set, which I thought that was interesting. It was, Dad, knock, 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 knock. And he was shaking. And I said, oh, my God. I said, that's insane. He goes, Dad, there's some, there was somebody in my room. I said, I believe you. I believe you. Uh, I said, go back to sleep. We'll leave the light on. We'll leave your door open. Hopefully it won't happen again. Fine. Okay, so the next morning, he's still, he's asleep. The door's open. He's asleep. Me, my girlfriend, my daughter uh, are in the kitchen making breakfast. And then we hear slam really loud. <clears throat> slam really loud. My son's door slammed closed. And he goes, Dad. Someone just closed my door. So I ran down the hall. I tried to open the door to his room, Robbie. The door was like, it felt like someone was on the other side, not letting me open the door for like five seconds. It's like, what's happening? Then I opened the door. He sat up. He was in bed. He did not close the door. This was not a gust of wind. <laughs> he goes, Dad, something just slammed my door closed. I go, I know, I know. So then... I remembered I had a Ouija board in our in our closet where all our games were. Okay. Near the games too. Was it next to Clue? <clears throat> you know, yeah, Monopoly and Clue and That's whatever. rough, dude. I've never in my life <laughs> whatever whatever the games were at the time. Uh Uno, all the games. I pulled it out and I said to my girlfriend, my son and my daughter, I said, you know what? Let's just do this. Maybe we'll figure out what the hell is, because clearly something's happening that's just off the wall in this house. Something's happening. We laid down the Ouija board, me, my daughter, my uh, me, my girlfriend, my son, and my daughter, the four of us. The thing that moves is called the planchette, the plastic thing. Right. We put our hands on the planchette. I led this session. We're sitting on the hallway floor. I said, uh, I said, is there a ghost in my house? And the thing wrote, yes, right away. It said, yes. Then I said, what's your name? And Robbie, it wrote Joseph. Okay. I'm like, okay. I said, Joseph, where are you from? And I'm going to get chills when I tell you this part. Where are you from? He wrote Syria. Okay. My grandpa, Joseph, was from Syria. Okay. My father's father, Joseph, was born in Syria. Okay. Then I go, are you my grandpa, Joe? Yes. Right away. Yes. I start crying because I love this guy. This guy died when I was 11 in 1967. This is now the year 2003. I go, you're my grandpa Joe? Yes, I start crying. I said, Grandpa Joe, why are you here? And it wrote Jordan, that's my son's name, it wrote Jordan. I said, what do you want with Jordan? And he wrote, to, te to teach. Uh, my grandfather was an Orthodox Jewish cantor who spoke Hebrew. Um, so, and my son was half Jewish and that's the whole thing. So maybe he wanted to teach my son Hebrew, but he said to teach. And then I said to teach what? And then it wrote, this thing wrote a phrase in Hebrew. Now I, I'm not prolific in Hebrew. I knew it as a child, but I wrote it down on a piece of paper. It wrote a phrase in Hebrew. I wrote it down in Hebrew on a piece of paper. I stopped the game. I called my dentist because my dentist spoke Hebrew. And I asked him, I said, what does this phrase mean in English? And I read it to him over the phone. And he said, it means I am a stranger here. So I sat back down. I said, Grandpa Joe, 
you are a stranger here? Yes. No, I didn't know what that was. Then my girlfriend said, Danny, you got to get rid of this thing. You got to get rid of this thing. This thing is interrupting our lives. And then I said, Grandpa Joe, I love you. I miss you. I said, you have to please leave my house. You're scaring me and my family. You can't be here anymore. I please, I need you to, with respect, I need you to leave. And it wrote, yes. Okay. And then that was it. And then a minute later, I said, Grandpa Joe, are you still here? And then nothing happened again with the board. And nothing ever happened. I lived in that house for another year. Nothing ever happened again after that. Now, if that wasn't my grandpa, Joe, oh, and remember when my girlfriend moved in and she heard Joe on day one, she yeah. heard Joe. So either my grandpa, Joe, was telling my girlfriend I'm here or another ghost or entity in that house was welcoming like Joe, my grandpa, into their world. Like, Joe, is that you? So that's my grandpa Joe Poltergeist story. If that wasn't him, I, I have no idea who it was. Is that the last time you saw your grandpa? Only to, the only time that anything like that happened. How did you come to grips with telling him that he had to go? Uh, my kids were crying. I mean, my my kids were they were like dad were scared. I mean, my girlfriend, my son, my daughter, they were like we were all crying. Like, get rid of this thing. And I had to, uh, Robbie, it was slamming doors, right? It was, it broke a glass. It was scaring my son. It wasn't cool that he was there. I loved him. I would have loved if he was an apparition to have a conversation. I mean, I loved this guy. He died when I was 11. I was devastated when he died. But well, if he's slamming doors and breaking glasses and scaring my family, no. I, so I had to, I had really had no choice. And honest to God, nothing ever happened again. I was there for another over a year. Nothing ever happened again. Not even close. That was the end of it. And then I threw the we. I think my daughter said, "Dad, please throw that Ouija board away." I threw it away. Uh, I didn't want to deal with that ever again. And nothing else like that happened again. Now, how did you determine it was a poltergeist rather than just a way that a spirit was trying to communicate with you? Okay, so poltergeist in I believe it's German. It means loud ghost loud ghost while slamming the doors loud uh crashing a, a, a glass on the on, on on the bathroom floor is loud knocking on my son's walls is loud you know it, it saved my face when it pulled that torch out of my hand man i was very grateful for that because uh that was my grandfather he saved my face because my face would have gone up in flames but yeah poltergeist means loud ghost he was loud he was loud did he ever have any like things that he didn't accomplish or anything that might have been a reason he stayed behind again my son and my daughter are half jewish half not jewish my grandfather was an orthodox jewish cantor my son had already had his bar mitzvah the year before but my grandfather was very much that his children and his grandchildren and his descendants would remain jewish okay so at 14, my son had his bar mitzvah, and then he goes, Dad, I don't want to study Hebrew anymore. I go, I know. Same with me. When I was 14, I started playing the drums. I'm like, I don't want to do Hebrew school anymore. I believe my grandfather, because Robbie, he said, Jordan to teach. He wanted to teach my son Hebrew. That's what it was, clearly. That's what it was. He was a Hebrew teacher. He was a cantor in the temple and a Hebrew teacher. So... That's what it was. He never got to meet my my son. You know, I was eleven when he when he when he died. So he never met my children, and that was what it would have been to continue his uh, Jewish faith and his. He was a Hebrew scholar, to, so that was yeah. That's what it was. He wanted to teach my son Hebrew. Did you spark up any interest after that to try and dig deeper into his life a little bit more? No. You no. said he passed away when you were eleven. Yeah. So I feel like I like for me, I still have so many questions for my family members that are no longer with us where I was like, damn, I like my grandma, for instance, she was married a JFK Secret Service agent. And I didn't find out about that until after she died. You know how upset I was about that? Wait, wait, which which agent? Was Walter it? Coughlin. Really? Wow. He's he, given, must have, 
he's given uh like interviews and stuff on for the sixth floor museum and he's like non-conspiracy at all but then like he'll let it out a little bit where he goes if i had to think about who could have possibly been behind it besides oswald i definitely would go for mob involvement there was and then he'll start going into the more conspiracy side of things I'm like damn dude let me interview you i just want to get it out of him oh you should well you were related to him did you ever get a chance I ne no, I I've never got the chance. He doesn't do any interviews. I've only seen one for the Six Four Museum. You but, should um, tell him. Tell him you're a relative. I, I mean, you literally. You're my a mom relative. begged me not to ever go to that. She, my grandmom, apparently said he was not a very nice guy, and I don't know because the Secret Service back then they all had the kind of darker reputation. I always felt so bad for Clint Hill, man. That guy had some PTSD, boy. I mean, he missed by what you know, eight second. I mean, it's a, a couple of seconds he missed. Because he was hur hurled his body. I mean, if JFK had just had the back wound and the neck wound, he, he probably would have lived. He might have lost his voice. You ever think about that? You know, he's shot in the neck. He might have lost it. And he turned blue. I just saw something last night when they got, when he got to Parkland, he was blue because he couldn't breathe through his neck. But he, he probably would have lost his voice, but he would have been alive. I mean, if Clint Hill had. Uh, no, he wouldn't. He, would, he wouldn't. He wouldn't have been alive. He got shot in the head. No, no, depending yeah, on, depending no, no. on if no, you look I know. At no, I'm saying if Clint, if Clint Hill had, well, moved Clint Hill faster. beat himself up about that because he was out till four o'clock in the morning, uh, drinking at the cellar. Him and like nine other Secret Service agents. But it's always a question. I would. I never got interested in JFK until after she died. I think it was right towards the end when she was becoming a little bit more, uh, you know, unspeakable. I would say she could, she could, she stopped being able to talk and stuff like that. But there's Dementia questions or, now. You know, no, she, she um, she just was old. She smoked a lot. And uh, her lungs and her whole kind of body was shutting down. She withered away basically to nothing. I'm sorry. But uh, that's, yeah, that's rough. Questions for um, your grandfather, though. I mean, you didn't want to look into his life a little bit more and try no, to figure out. No, because I, no, I, I knew it was him. I knew enough. He came from Syria. He was one of nine brothers. He came to Brooklyn at the turn of the last century. <clears throat> he had a little children's clothing store. He was a cantor, orthodox cantor. Uh, I saw him and quite a few times when I was little. I would say my father and he were pretty close. No, I didn't have any. There was no mystery. I knew it was him. When he said Joseph from Syria, man, that's my grandfather. I mean, who else is that going to be? Yeah, that's that's deep. I mean, I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty good because nobody else in that room. Like there were four of us with the planchette. I didn't write Syria with my hands. Right, this thing was flying, man. This thing is flying around the board. When it wrote Syria, I'm like, oh, my God, it's my grandfather. I knew it was him. I had tears instantly. I said, Grandpa Joe, is that you? Yes. Yes, right away. Now, I, I forget who told me recently, but they said, you know, Dan, uh, when you use a Ouija board, they'll tell you whatever it is that you want to hear. Now, Robbie, when I did the Ouija board, my Grandpa Joe was the last thing on my mind on the planet Earth. I would not in one million years have thought, yeah, this. Let's. I'm going to summon my grandpa. How would I know that? I, I, I wouldn't have known that. He told me who he was. So it's either a. a, a it was either a, a spirit pretending to be my grandpa Joe, or it was my grandpa Joe. And he said to teach Jordan. Well, that's pretty good. To teach Jordan. That and then he wrote, "I am a stranger here in Hebrew." Okay, well, if that's not my grandpa Joe. I don't know. What the hell, what the hell. It makes you kind of wonder how long he was connected to you. Yeah, here's what's funny. I have pictures of him in my scrapbooks. I have like I have like 40, literally 40 scrapbooks. So, and you know, when I moved into the house, they were, of course, in boxes uh, that went into the closet. So if he was attached to his old, but, but I've had those photos since I'm a child. <clears throat> Why would he suddenly show up? I mean, I've had those pictures since I'm 11 years old. Now, at that time, I was like 40 something. 40, whatever I was, 43, 48. I don't know how old I was. Why would he just show up all of a sudden? I was thinking maybe he got, he woke up when the moving men were moving my boxes of my photo albums. But, uh, or maybe he was there waiting for me. I, I have no idea. I, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Now, how long after that until you had your experience with your father? <clears throat> Okay, so that was 2003 with my grandfather. My father, here, this is just a, a series of remarkable stories. Um, my father died in, in April 2017, seven years ago. 
Okay. So now uh, let me preface. I have to go back because I want to tell you this whole story. In March, March 1970, I was 13 years old. My father picked me up one day from school to drive me home. It was about three in the afternoon, daylight. I'm in my father's car, and this is in New Jersey, our suburban street in New Jersey. And he's driving me home. I see through the windshield, there's a huge UFO above my father's car. It's a silver V like Victor shaped craft, shiny silver V hovering above my father's car, maybe four or 500 feet above my father's car. Hovering, silent, no smoke, no propellers, no noise, nothing. I look through the windshield, I go, dad, there's a UFO. Dad, stop the car, stop the car, there's a UFO. We stop the car, we get out, we're looking straight up, Robbie, it's hovering directly above our heads. I'm jump, literally jumping with my finger, I'm jumping up and down. Dad, look, there's a UFO, Dad, it's Star Trek, it's Star Trek, isn't this great? Dad, isn't this cool, isn't this cool? Oh my God, Dad, isn't this cool? And Robbie, my father looked at it like this. No interest, looks at his watch, looks at the car, looks at his shoes, looks up, no interest whatsoever, couldn't care less, no reaction. Now that's the whole key to this whole story. No reaction whatsoever. After two, about a minute, two minutes, maybe two minutes, he goes, come on, kid, let's go home. Get in the car, we go home. I call the rotary phone, March 1970. There's a rot rotary phone in the kitchen. I called the Asbury Park Press newspaper. I said, hi, my name is Danny. I'm 13. Uh, my dad and I just saw a UFO in our neighborhood. The lady said, Sonny, I can't talk to you right now. We're getting hundreds of phone calls. I have to go. I'm very sorry. That's what she said. I remember very clearly. That's what she told me. <clears throat> no article ever ran in the newspaper that week. Okay. And then, so Robbie, I forgot that that happened for 47 years. Completely forgot that that happened for 47 years. Why? I was a drummer. I was in rock bands. I was going to rock concerts. I was chasing girls. I was getting straight A's in school. I was growing. I had really long hair. Never even... My, and I never discussed it with my father, ever. Never, ever did I discuss that event with my dad. I wish I had. But now, it's now it's 2017, April. My father dies in Florida with his second wife. He had a bad death. I'm here in L.A. when he died. I get the call. Through about three days later, I went to our favorite deli here in L.A. My father and I used to go to this deli to get pastrami sandwiches together, right? So I went to this deli to get a pastrami sandwich in my father's honor and to think about my dad and be sad. So I go to this deli and everything I'm about to tell you is true. I went to the deli, ordered my, oh, sorry. Oh, I ordered my sandwich. The waiter walked away. I'm sitting there minding my own business. A beam of light or energy, something from above came from above, bang, into my head like this, really hard into the right side of my head bang like this into my head and then through my eyes and my brain robbie projected in front of me in the air about six eight inches in front of my face 3d color hologram home movie with audio of my 1970 ufo setting with my father okay it played it played in the air like i'm looking at you now i'm like holy s i can't believe this i remember that now, it's not a memory because I was in this home movie. It was me, my dad, the car, the V. And it was like, my joke is God, the cameraman, was behind my father's car. Because it was it captured the whole scene. And in this little clip, I'm like, Dad, there's a UFO. I'm jumping up and down with my finger. And I'm like, I remember that. I remember that. My dad's looking at it, bored to tears. And then my dad winked at me. He looks down at me, he winks at me. And he said, come on, let's go home. Okay, so then this clip, I'm going to say 30 seconds, it played. And then it went, it vanished. My heart's beating fast. My hands are shaking. I'm like, what the hell was that? Oh, my God. Now I hear a voice in my ear. <clears throat> get a pen, get a pen. You need a pen, you need a pen. I asked the waiter for a pen. Put it in my right hand. I'm right-handed. On the table at the deli, there was a paper placemat in front of, in front of me. My hand did automatic writing. I'm sure you, you know, you've heard of that. I never did it before or since in my life. But that day, my hand wrote, write a book about benevolent aliens. Then my hand wrote, lead character's father knew about UFOs. Then my hand wrote, capital A, capital T, capital C. And then my hand stopped moving. 
I'm looking at this paper. I'm like, what is happening to me? What on earth is happening to me? And I look and look at this ATC for like five, 10 minutes. And then I came up with my title for my book after they came, ATC. So then I get my pastrami sandwich. I inhaled it. I go home and I wrote that book. I wrote it over the next eight months. That book was given to me from above. I believe it was my father's uh, spirit from heaven that gave me that digital download and the handwriting. Steve Bassett thinks it was an ET download, that it was extraterrestrial driven. I believe it was my father from heaven. Now, here's the key to the whole story. Who was my father? My father worked for the Army for 45 years, U.S. Army. He was an a electronics engineer and a, and a physicist for the U.S. Army for 45 years. My father was a genius. My father helped invent military drones. Okay. I researched him after he died, and I researched his workplace called Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And there's a lot of data I could tell you, but bottom line is I am now convinced that my father worked on military drones for the army uh, that incorporated reverse engineering of extraterrestrial technology. I am convinced of that. Um, after he died, I asked my mother if he dad ever talked about UFOs. She told me a story I'd never heard before after he died. She said, in the early 50s, they took your dad deep into the vaults of Fort Monmouth Army Base. They showed him something above top secret. They said, you can never tell anyone. My father came home that night, Robbie. And my mother said he was pale and shaking and really nervous and upset. And my mother goes, honey, what's wrong? And my father said to my mother, I saw something today in the vaults. I can never tell you about as long as I live. I can never tell anyone as long as I live. So my father never did. He never told anyone what he saw that day. Um, last year, Stephen Greer gave a presentation at the Washington Press Club about all the whistleblowers he has lined up who can testify before Congress once the Schumer Rounds bill hopefully gets passed so they will be protected. So in his talk, it was last June, he presented a slide of 145 U.S. military bases that Greer has proof of that worked on a reverse engineering of ET technology. 145 military bases. I freeze-framed that slide, Robbie, on my TV, and I went up with my finger. Number 51 said Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. My dad worked there from 1951 to 1996. That's only four years after Roswell. Okay. Now, I found in my scrapbook after my father died, I found a profile of my father. I never knew I had it. After he died, it's from 1985. It basically says my father helped invent military drones using laser technology. Well, nobody in my family knew that. My brothers and my mother, we, didn't, we never knew what the hell my father did for a living. My father never said two words. He never said two words. So the silver V I saw with my dad in 1970, right? He had no reaction. He winked at me. My father knew what that was. He knew what it was. My, my gut feeling is that he had a hand in designing it or he had seen it. My mother said he used to go to um, White Sands Missile Testing Range. She said he went there all the time for decades. Uh, so my dad knew what it was. He knew what that was. And after he died, when I get a pastrami sandwich, my father sent me a movie from heaven and he said, Danny, I couldn't tell you what I did for a living my whole life. But remember that UFO we saw together 47 years ago? My, my father was telling me, uh, now I'm giving you a hint here, Danny. This is a clue who your father was. And then I wrote a book, and the book changed my life. My book, after they came, changed my life. Because I met Steve Bassett. <clears throat> I created the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. I'm the publicist for Contact in the Desert. I have my own podcast. And I'm friends with Richard Dolan, Nick Poe, Paul Hynek, and everybody else you could think of. So that deli sandwich that day changed my life. I mean, if that's not a paranormal series of stories, I don't know what is. I hope you gave them a five-star review on Yelp or something. <clears throat> Who? Whoever made the pastrami sandwich for you. Uh, I gave him a good tip. Oh. Absolutely. I think I gave him a 20. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I honest, honest to God, that, that event, that day, I just went to more than, <clears throat> I don't know, my voice is crazy. I just went to more than my father, Robbie. Literally, I just went to more than my father, I came out with a book that changed my life. So you tell me what that was. I, I want to ask about your involvement in the whole UAP disclosure. 
Um, obviously, if you're talking to other people that have had either UFO experiences or ex just experienced their stories, did you come across anything that was similar to yours? Um, the other day I did a presentation for MUFON St. Louis, <laughs> MUFON St. Louis through the computer. There's a woman named Debbie Ziegelmeyer. She's been in the UFO space, I think 40 or 50 years. I told the story I just told you. She said, Dan, when I was a little kid, I saw a UFO. She goes, I was very young, maybe five. I saw a UFO. She goes, recently. I had a vision. She said, I had a vision. And in her vision, she saw that event. She's got to be, this lady has to be 70 now. She said, I saw the event. And she said, Dan, like you, it wasn't through my eyes point of view. I saw me in the vision. I saw me and my friends who was with me that day and the UFO. I saw it as though the camera was feet away. And she said, Dan, you're the only other person I've ever heard of who had a, uh, a, a, a flashback in which you yourself were in it. It wasn't from your eyes and your memory. You were in it. She goes, yeah, that's the only other thing I've ever, you're the only other person I've ever heard. And I said the same to her. I said, I've never heard that anyone that had that story. I have friends who have been abducted and have had very awful, horrible experiences. <clears throat> I have a good friend who's been friends who's been abducted every few years by the Pleiadians for over 50 years, fantastic experiences. He said, they're the most beautiful. They're so beautiful. You cry when you see them. He said 10 years ago, he's 60. Now he started getting abducted when he was five. And actually this is funny. A lot of people I know was, was the age of five, including me, right? When I fell off the sign was five. Uh, a, a number of people I know five, the age of five. There, there's something there that I know because I, I, I could several people I know. But anyway, uh, my friend Mark, uh, he said 10 years ago, the Pleiadians told him to bring solar power to the American, to the Indian, Native American Indians in the American Southwest, bring them solar energy. They need it there. My friend Mark created the Solar Utility Network. He's brought solar power, power to tens of thousands of Native American Indians. And he's become a millionaire in the process. And uh, he's a hero. He's a hero to the Native American Indians. The Pleiadians told him to do that. And he did. And he said it changed his life. So I have had friends with bad experiences. I know women who have, were pregnant, who had their fetuses taken. And then years later, they were shown hybrid children. Uh, Debbie, Co Debbie Jordan Koppel, she was the inspiration for the book uh, Intruders by Bud Hopkins. She uh, she's a good friend of mine. She said she was pregnant. They took her baby. And then seven years later, they took her again. They showed her the baby. It was an alien hybrid. They And she said she wanted to hold it and touch it. They only let it. They only let her look at it from a distance. And then they said, we just want you to know that your child is safe with us. And then they sent her back. So I'm just babbling now. I don't know where I'm going. When it comes to what protections are available for people who have these types of experiences, um, what are the current protections and then what is this bill supposed to do to help um, protect the rights of individuals? Because I have a lot of friends or just people I've met through doing the show that have had experience or stories and obviously society has kept them very reluctant in coming forward for the longest time. It's only been the past couple of years we've seen more and more openness about it and then the government admits it. No, to be honest, nobody cared. That was the crazy thing to me. I was like, how are we not like partying right now? I mean, the UFO community definitely cared, but a lot of people were just like, oh, and then they kind of like moved out of it. Like the government had just admitted that there were things that they have not been able to explain when in the past they were making scientists who even questioned or wanted to look into it as a scientific inquiry. They were calling them nut jobs or tinfoil hat people. I was like, this is a day in history. It would be like if more Kennedy files got released, which will never happen. Absolutely. Well, after Grush came forward, first of all, Grush is the hero of heroes, number one. Number two, after Grush came forward, they were like, you know, he had depression and he was an alcoholic, uh, his PTSD, and, and he yelled at his wife 10 years ago. So they still, they're still discrediting people like that. I want to answer your question in two ways. There's two things. 
for experiencers who've had, let's say, problematic or scary experiences, MUFON has the experiencer research team. It's called ERT, I believe it is, or ERT, ERT. MUFON has the experiencers research team. Kathy Martin is one of the heads of it. Her aunt and uncle were Betty and Barney Hill. My friend Earl Gray Anderson is one of the heads of it. He's the head of MUFON Southern California. They work with experiencers, right? Like, tell us your story. What do you think it means? Uh, here are some resources for you. They'll hook them up with people like my friend Yvonne Smith to get hip hypnotized if they want to, if they want to explore it. But but they're a uh, they're like a comfort group for people who have had not great experiences. MUFON's ERT team. That's one answer to your question. The other answer to your question, Schumer rounds bill. Do you know the name Danny Sheehan? Do you know who Danny Sheehan is? I've heard the name, yeah. Danny Sheehan is a genius civil rights attorney in Washington, D.C., and he's on my board of directors for Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. He worked with Chuck Schumer, and I think it's Michael or Mark Rounds, two senators. So the Schumer Rounds bill, it's been uh, negated by the GOP in the House. The, the, the GOP in the House will not pass it. Chuck Schumer wants to pass it in the Senate. I'm sure Biden would have signed it. Uh, the House won't let it go through. The Schumer Rounds bill will protect, essentially, Stephen Greer has like 100 whistleblowers lined up at the ready. And his people are people who worked in the military, worked in the government, worked for private contractors. Um, these are the like people who know where UFOs are, the craft are, knows where alien bodies are, knows where the technology is. The contractors worked on reverse engineering of the technology. So the so Danny Sheehan and Chuck Schumer are trying desperately. It was just reintroduced again the other day. It'll never pass because our wonderful friends in the House, our wonderful Republican friends in the House. But it would protect Stephen Greer's 100 whistleblowers and the next 5,000 people behind them so they can testify before Congress. <laughs> they won't get um, thrown in jail. They won't be harassed at home. They won't lose their pensions and they won't be audited by the IRS. Now, my dad never told a, uh, said a word to anyone in, in, in 50, 60 years, not one word. Why? My dad <clears throat> couldn't wait to get his pension. I remember my dad in his 40s and 50s, you know, when I'm 65, I can retire, I get my pension, I get my pension. I remember my dad was not gonna blow his pension <clears throat> to tell my mother and his three sons, yeah, aliens exist. There was no way he was gonna do that. It just was not going to happen. But someone like Grush in 2023 has the balls to come forward and say, look, this is what's happening. And we need to discuss this with the public. You know, they he wanted to get a skiff for, with Tim Burchett and, and Mario Rubio, Marco Rubio and all those people. They never got him a skiff. They were unable to get him a skiff. He never was able to tell them where the bodies but, are. In the wait, hold on. So after all that hearing process and that woman kept saying, we'll discuss this in a skiff. We'll discuss never happened. This. Never happened. Skiff never happened. Whoever runs the black, whoever is the new, the head of Majestic 12 in, in 2024, whoever still runs essentially what Majestic 12 was, they would not let him do that. Isn't that crazy? Congress and senators couldn't get crushed in a skiff. How about that? Think about that. They, they don't want the truth out. They just don't want it out. What do you think about the public's perception of the UAP discussion? I mean, I see it trend on Twitter a lot or X, um, but for a while, that, like that was a large focus for me. I was trying to speak, obviously, with Avi Loeb, Nick Pope and others um, that I had on the show because it was something that wasn't really being talked about. And it seemed like there's a lot of credible evidence. And then once the whole discussion or the government admitted to it, I just didn't buy it. I don't know why they had waited so long for them to do it. Um, we had been waiting Well, a lot of people have been waiting like decades, basically, for someone to acknowledge or do anything like that. And the government just openly said it. it caused a lot of suspicion for me. But I also noticed a lot of people just was like, OK, and then like moved on to the next thing. I was like, well, hold on. That's like a monumental thing. It was like landing on Mars. When that happened, nobody gave a shit. <laughs> you should talk to Stephen. When's the, have you ever interviewed Steve Bassett? Not Steve Bassett. No. OK, you, you I'll, I'll hook that up for you. Okay, you need to interview Steve Bassett since 1996. 
he and Stephen Greer and Danny Sheehan, those three guys, um, have been pushing and wanting disclosure. It's all Steve Bassett does. He's a disclosure advocate. It's all he does is lobbies, lobbying, lobbies, lobbies, whatever the word, lobbies in Washington for politicians to essentially approve the Schumer rounds or, or to disclose. These, him, Greer, and Danny Sheehan, they're all about disclosure. They want disclosure. Um, the, there's, there's different theories why we've never been told, okay? I think there's four or five theories. Let me see if I remember them. Why we've never been told. Number one, Roswell happened in 47, two years after World War II. Truman knew all about Roswell. He knew there was an extraterrestrial beings and a craft. He knew all about it. He covered it up. I have an idea, Robbie, for an incredible film. I have to pitch this someday. If Truman had not covered up Roswell on day one, right? If there had not been the truth embargo on day one and Truman had gone on, t on, on radio in 47 and said, look, we have a craft, we have bodies, extraterrestrials exist, we'll deal with it, we'll figure it out. The whole world would be a different place today. Be a different place today. So I blame Truman. Truman on day, and you know, when Roswell happened, Walter Hout did a press release. I'm a publicist. I've done ten thousand press releases. Walter Hout did a press release. Hey, we have a we have a uh, we have a, a UFO, and uh, it's on our base. We have it. It's from outer space. <clears throat> the next day, they had to say, "Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. It was a weather balloon. It's a weather balloon. Our mistake." These guys were brilliant. They knew the difference between a UFO and a weather balloon. Truman. Truman shut it down on day one, and that's when he created Majestic 12 uh, two months later. Majestic 12 happened in September 47. I am a Truman fan. I'm sorry. No, I think he was a, very, I think he was a great president, but I think he blew that one, man. I only respect him later when he was questioning things like the Dag Hammarskjöld planes crash, where he said openly to the press, he goes, he was on the verge of getting something done when they killed him. And then he says, notice, I said, they killed him and no press followed up on it. And then when Kennedy died, he made a statement about the CIA saying that the institution he originally created has long been diverged from its original plan. And it seems to be running rogue. And we can tell because of uh, seems like anyone that's on the verge of doing something happens to end up gone. You know, the story about um, James Forrestal. I'm sure you do. I've probably have heard it. I just might have to refresh okay. my memory. All right. So this is, this is, this is classic what we're dealing with. Okay, Roswell happened uh, July 47. Um, Truman created Majestic 12, September 47. <clears throat> Majestic 12 were, were 12 military leaders, scientists, and political advisors to, to Truman. One of them was James Forrestal. He was the very first Secretary of Defense. And from what I've learned and read and seen on documentaries, Forrestal wanted to tell the world, hey, let's tell the world the aliens and UFOs exist. Let, you know, he's like the one guy in the room. Hey, what, instead of doing all this subterfuge and obfuscation and, 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 and hiding this remarkable thing that happened to mankind in Roswell, why don't we just tell them the truth? They put Forrestal in a mental hospital Oh shit! Yeah, and he was there. I think for a week, and at the end of that week, he was pushed out of. I think it was a 12, 12 story window. He was pushed out of a window, and and killed. His family said in a million years he would not have killed himself. He was murdered. He was murdered because he wanted to tell the world about aliens. Now here, this is even more interesting. James Forrestal was good friends with JFK. JFK told, and here's a whole, we can go all down this rabbit hole if you want to. JFK told Marilyn Monroe in bed, you know, there's little bodies. There were little bodies uh, recovered at Roswell. It was in Marilyn Monroe's little red diary. It's why Bobby Kennedy's people killed Marilyn Monroe. She was going to tell the world that JFK knew about alien bodies and that JFK was trying to have Fidel Castro assassinated because JFK is called pillow talk. JFK told Marilyn Monroe things he should not have told her. And that's why Bobby Kennedy and his people killed Marilyn Monroe. That's a whole separate issue. Did you get the Bobby Kennedy killed Marilyn thing from the book uh, Bobby killed what a Marilyn, the end of Marilyn Monroe or something like that's by Douglas Thompson? 
I just read two books very recently that both said the same thing. I don't remember the name. Because I had Doug Thompson on here. He's a friend of the show. But um, I don't know about the whole Bobby killing Marilyn thing. No, he was there. No, he was there. I know he was there, but even... He was there He was yeah. there twice. No, he was there twice the day she died. Twice. In the morning, he was there with Peter Lawford. This is according to Eunice Murray, the housekeeper. She was there. He said, Marilyn, where's your diary? Because Marilyn was going to have a press conference on a Monday to tell the world how much she hated the Kennedy brothers because they both used her like a piece of meat. So Bobby and Peter Lawford went that sat. She died on a Sunday night, Sunday, I believe it was. He said, Marilyn, where's your diary? I need it. She goes, screw you. You're not getting my diary. She took a knife in the kitchen and ran after Bobby. Peter Lawford had to jump on her to not stab Bobby Kennedy. Then later that evening, Bobby came with two or three guys in black suits with bags. And um, that's when they gave her, apparently they gave her a fatal enema. That's why they never figured out how she died. I thought it was an injection into her back. It was apparent now because there were there were things found in her stomach that shouldn't have been there. I, it, what I read was a, a poison enema. Well, Thomas she, Noguchi said she swallowed barbiturates. That's the yeah, autopsy there, doctor of the stars. Yeah, but there was no drinking glass in her bedroom. There was no glass of water by which she could have swallowed like 60 pills. She died in the back room by the pool and then... She, they put her in an ambulance. They took her to St. John's Hospital. She died on the way. And then the, the ambulance brought her back to the house. She died at like 11 p.m. or midnight. They didn't call the police till 4 a.m. It was her housekeeper and her psychiatrist and another doctor. They, they staged everything. Don't they you normally them. wait like nine hours or 10 hours when someone's dead before you call somebody? <laughs> Yeah, they, no, they waited four hours. They waited four hours. It was so staged. Her, Robert her, her Wagner doctor. did with Natalie Wood. He waited a few hours. Oh, yeah, boy. Could he be more guilty, that guy? I know. I'm surprised that number two from Goldmember was a murderer. Yeah. Like how he never got arrested. Of course he did it. Of course he did it. I almost had Dennis DeVern on here, but you know, he needs a large sum of money to make that happen. You know who knows? Is it, what, what's his name? Um Walken, Christopher Walken. He hasn't really said much about it either. I got the notes from the detective that originally interviewed Walken the day Natalie Wood died, and then three days later in his hotel room, and you notice there's a change. When uh, Walken lawyers up, there's a few things that get changed from his initial statement of him and Wagner having beef that night. Yeah, Wagner broke a, a bottle of brandy or a drinking glass. Wine glass, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wagner probably said to Christopher Walken, listen, man, don't tell anybody. Here's a check for $3 million. Just keep it between us. Don't tell anybody. That's someone I can connect you with, Sam Peroni. He's the legal investigator who wrote the book on the Natalie Wood thing and came up with all this uh, investigative evidence. But um, yeah, there was witnesses that heard a woman screaming in the water when she went in and then heard a slurred voice say, hold on, we're coming to get you. And then they just assumed that they picked her up and she no, they never picked her up. Yeah, right. I know. I remember when that happened. That was very, very sad. Yeah, like she's going to go for a swim in the middle of the night in her nightgown, and she was scared to death of dark water, yeah. according to her sister. Deep, yeah, dark no. water, specifically deep, yeah. dark water. And she always knew she was, you know, she knew she had a pre premonition a as a child that she, was, that, told her. that she was going to drown in dark water. Yeah. That's not see, that's the crazy, like, sync. I don't even know that synchronicity, but there's a lot about like the JFK, all that type of stuff where you start going back, you're like, well, where's that stuff happening today? I don't see any of that. The thirteenth floor thing's weird that you mentioned because that's also Grant Stockdale, a close friend of JFK, fell out of a thirteen-story building. Oh, maybe it was for James Forrestal. I don't. I think it was twelfth, but maybe it might have been thirteenth. Yeah. Um, because that with Edward Stockdale, that's they said it was suicide, but um, a lot of evidence supports that on the twenty-sixth of November, three days after or four days after Kennedy was killed, um, he had flown and met Bobby Kennedy and Edward Kennedy. And uh, had a discussion with them. And then afterwards, he was speaking to his lawyer, talking about the assassination and that someone wanted JFK gone. And the next thing you know, what, December 8th, I think it was, he uh, falls out of a 13-story building, ruled as a suicide. I mean, there's books about all the witnesses who were murdered. Just stay Jack on one floor, people. Like, that's all you got to do. Yeah, all the there's uh, there's books, you know, Dorothy, yeah, Jim Gallen, Mars, you, and uh, you know, about Richard Dorothy, Belzer. you yeah. know, Dorothy Kilgallen, you know, that story probably. Yeah. She interviewed Jack Ruby at length, she got the scoop, she was going to write a book because he confessed to her she was murdered. 
Yeah, she was. Yeah. What's on that t- famous TV show? What, um, what's What's my line? I yeah, think. what's my line? She was found in her bed reading a book she had already yeah. read with, with makeup, her with her fake wig, fully dressed, reading a book. I guess her glasses, her reading glasses, weren't there. It was a bed she never. It was a guest room. She never ever slept in that bed in real life. She never went to bed without taking off her makeup and her hair piece. The best, the best one is Jim Cothey because he died official autopsy. His on his certificate says throat shop. He was stepping out of his shower and he had gotten blunt force trauma to the neck that caused. And the autopsy doctor put karate chop. And I was like, that's on the. And that got me a flag on YouTube for even making a clip about that because I make a clip about all the witnesses. But um, him. And, uh, well, Bill Hunter, who was accidentally shot by a police officer in the whatever press room part of the, the headquarters in L.A. or something like that. And that has been, like, verified. Those cops lied. Um, they said it was an accident on misfire when his gun fell. Uh, it found out in court that actually they were playing cops and robbers. I swear to you, these guys were police officers messing around with guns and accidentally killed Bill Hunter by shooting him in the heart. Those guys went to jail three years and then were out on probation. So, again, suspicious. I don't know, but... No, oh, yeah, of course. No, of course. It's, it's, it's pretty obvious. All right, so reasons why we've never been told. One is Orson Welles did the War of the Worlds radio broadcast, 1938. 1938. Roswell was uh, nine years later. All right, so Orson Welles, War of the Worlds broadcast, people were panicking in the streets. People had heart attacks because they thought Martians had come to New Jersey to kill people. So when Truman is president and Roswell happens, he remembered the panic in the streets from War of the Worlds. He's like, oh, we can't panic people. All right, so that's one panic. Now, that's a long time ago, man. If, 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 if Biden went on TV tonight and said there's aliens, we've known about them for 80 years, We'll keep you posted. I think at least half of the world would say, see, I told you, I knew. Yeah, well, I, we knew that. And the other half is going to go, oh, that's BS. Biden is, is old. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But anyway, so one of the reasons we've never been told panic in the streets, I think that's a long, ancient, it doesn't hold water anymore. Number two is if the aliens gave us free their free energy by which they travel, if they gave us their techno- energy technology, it would eliminate oil, coal, gas, lithium, and every nuclear, every power source we have now would be a whole different world for power. All the oil billionaires would go out of business and their heads would explode. So that's one. Another is if we have ET technology, we don't want the Russians and the Chinese and the North Koreans to know what we have because they might want to steal it. So that's also very antiquated. I interviewed Avi Loeb last night. Avi said one of the theories is that the aliens themselves have told our leaders, we, the aliens, are not yet ready to be revealed. That one makes a lot of sense to me. That one is like, that could explain it. That that would be a reason. If they said, we're not ready, don't do it yet. Or, you know, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll mutilate more cattle and kill, abduct more children. That's, I think, is a really good one. So those are the, those are the those are the primary reasons why we've not been told. Apparently, Dan, is there a place where people can find your books? I do appreciate you giving me the time to talk about this. Sure, sure. Dan Harari Author dot com. Dan H A R A R Y Author dot com is. I have five books. They're all up there. My bio, pictures of me with Spielberg and Jerry Seinfeld and Mel Brooks and Alice Cooper and Hugh Hefner and all the famous people I've worked with. So that's danharayauthor.com. If people are interested in ufology, I'm the chairman and founder of the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. We have about 200 members. If you're interested, hollywooddisclosurealliance.org. And we're, we're adding a button this week that says how to join. Uh, we have members all over the world. Half of our members are UFO and ET experiencers, researchers, and disclosure advocates. The other half, Robbie, are Hollywood writers, producers, and directors. It's the only group of its kind in the world. It was my my idea. It's one of my babies. And um, our membership are, are, are interacting with each other. We have a Slack channel. And they're interacting with each other with scripts and screenplays and documentaries and books and public speaking events. And uh, it's cross-pollination. People who have had remarkable experiences 
and people in Hollywood who are looking for stories and it's cross pollinating. I'm involved with a new TV show in development right now. It's based, we're calling it Jason Bourne meets the X files. And that came through with the Hollywood disclosure Alliance. I am an associate producer on this show. If it happens and and we've only been around a year. So in 10 years from now, we'll probably have each. We're hoping to get Spielberg and J.J. Abrams and people to join us as members. But uh, yeah, so Dan Harari, author.com and HollywoodDisclosureAlliance.org. Those are the two ways to get me. And this was super fun, man. Thanks very much. And, uh, you know, let me know if I can help you get. You need to get Steve Bassett. I can I can in, email and show you. That takes two seconds. We do got a plan to talk about JFK at some point. We'll do an episode on that one day. But I will link all your links in the description, Dan. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for another episode.